the school of aquaponics. Yes, my question would have concerning Dr. Wilson's statement where he states that if you stock low, you will not have this excessive nitrate. And with his research and trials, he found that 13 kilograms per square meter per day will be the okay. But this method implies that the rest of the nutrients have to be supplemented into the system. So let's stop right here so we can give the people an understanding on what you're referring to. Because a lot of people out there probably don't have an idea about what the freak you're talking about. Um, this different stocking density and um, they just might be unsure. So we're going to go to the actual literature and we're going to break it down so people can get an understanding and get the insight on what you're referring to. So let's go over to the literature um, and then pull it up and then we'll start reading um, from Dr. Wilson Leonard's um, approach to sizing an aquaponic system because he is one of the aquaponic gods out there um, of a high level. So let's go over there and, um, get our breakdown on. So when you go here to this literature that we're reading from, this is basically breaking down the different scientifically proven ways to size the uh, aquaponic or the uh, aquaculture and the hydroponic components in the aquaponic system. And there's really two scientifically proven ways and that's it. That's it. There's no other ways to do it. There's other wing ways you can wing it. You can wing it and get an aquaponic system to work, which is like the biscuit headed model. Um, but you can get it to work though, but the scientifically proven there's two ways. So this is his way um, of breaking it down and what he did through his studies. So let's go through it um, and start off with, um, we'll probably just do the overview of it and then we'll get to the main points of it. I came to aquaponics a little later than James Rakosi and have been studying it for the last 12 years. This article was written in 2012 to give you some context. So that would be uh, an extra, what, four years, no, five years. So it would be 15 years, no, what would it be? 17 years total for him um, as of now, just to give you some context. My initial four way into aquaponics was an extensive literature review as a lead up to my PhD studies. This, of course, made me acutely aware of the pioneering scientific work of James Rakosi. So Dr. Wilson is doing his PhD studies in aquaponics, and he found out when you start doing that, there's no way to get around. You're going to run across Dr. James Rakosi because he's the creme de la creme, the, the, the granddaddy of aquaponics. So you're going to run across his literature. Matter of fact, let's bring uh, uh, Dr. Rakosi down from aquaponic paradise. Let's drop him down real quick. So he's primarily responsible for what jump start, what jump started modern day aquaponics. So he laid out the blueprint to follow from a scientific perspective. So he's given him his just due and he came across his literature. That's basically what he's talking about. One of the main requirements of any PhD is to produce new and novel information. This means I could not simply copy the work of Rakasi and had a strong requirement to produce new and different methods and approaches. So his PhD thesis is going to be uh, is going to revolve around an approach to uh, basically sizing an aquaponic system. But you can't use Dr. Rakasi's uh, uh, method, which is very hard because there's not too many ways that you can possibly size a system because the feed amount is pretty much the determining factor. Um, but he was able to squeeze out another method, which, which, which is exactly what we're going to learn about as we keep going. On reading and understanding Rakasi's work, I decided to develop a different approach to aquaponic feeding rate ratios, and this is what the main thrust of my PhD work was about. I reasoned that if using the Rakasi approach produce an excess of nitrogen, then what happens if nitrogen is actually balanced in aquaponic systems? i.e. fish waste nitrogen production equals plant nitrogen use. So he's been reading in the literature and he finds out that Dr. Rakasi's approach produces excessive amounts of nitrogen, more nitrogen than what the plants need and what's necessary in the system. What happens? What in the freak happens if I supply just enough nitrogen for the plant demand? What's going to happen in the system? This is his, this is his approach to the feeding rate. Let's continue. The hypothesis was that as long as an approach was developed to make sure the entire plant nutrient requirements were still met, then less fish feed and fish would be required to operate the system. So he's hypothesizing that if he feeds just enough to where the nitrogen level uh, meets the plant demand, then we can have a lower stocking density. Therefore, we can feed lower feeding rates as well. 
This approach was also developed from a commercial perspective, meaning that if fish numbers could be lowered, then so would capital outlay cost to construct the fish component, and this may lead to acceptable economic returns. I spent three and a half years performing a series of experiments. How long did he spend? Three and a half years, three and a half years running these experiments, trying to find out correct feeding rate ratios. So it takes a long, this is a long process. It's not something you just come up with um, uh, out of the back of, out of the blue somewhere. One month, oh, I got the formula. You know, I had, it's crazy because I was talking to one person in the chats. We were discussing about water volume and feeding rate ratios and how water volume contributes to the amount of feed input. And the guy is saying, no, 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 no. He's determined that it doesn't have, that it doesn't have any effect. So this was about what, four weeks ago. Then two weeks after, this is only two weeks after the, the discussion, I get an email from the person. I'm not going to say his name because I'm not in the business of embarrassing people, but I get an email or a comment on in, in the school comment section from this guy, and he's telling me how he's ran the test. This is only two weeks later. He's ran the test, and all of a sudden he's come back. Now he has the secret sauce. He's got the secret sauce. He's, fa he's figured out the formula, the calculations. He's ran the experiments. He's now got the secret McDonald's sauce for the aquaponic system. And I'm just thinking to myself, this is amazing right here. This is amazing. It took Dr. Wilson three and a half years to come up with a formula, test it over and over again, and now this guy comes back two weeks later. And, it's, and, the re and I didn't respond because I know he's just trying to prove some type of point. Whether he's correct or, or incorrect, it doesn't matter. He just wants to try to find some way to prove a point. So, of course, I'm going to ignore that. It's not worth my time. Not Definitely not worth my time. So, I'm just thinking, you can't even grow a one, you can't even grow a plant. I don't know any plant growing in, in aquaponics that has a life cycle of two weeks. How do you come back with the secret sauce within two weeks of time? Impossible. You have to run the test over and over. We're limited by the, the life cycle of the plant is one of the limiting factors of running experiments. That's why it takes three and a half years sometimes to run to run certain experiments because you have to you're limited by how much you have to wait for the plant to grow two months three months is like minimum for the majority of the plants that were grown in aquaponics so you have to wait those life cycles out before you're able to test it take your notes run other experiments make sure there's nothing else contributing to it make sure that it's predictable it's accurate and it can be uh, uh replicated over and over again so it take it takes time for this. So it took a long time for him to come up with this um, with this ratio that he's um, he's explaining here, a, a, a contrary to what some other people may believe that you can just whip up something real quick. It doesn't work that way. That eventually allowed me to develop a new and unique method of determining aquaponic feeding rate ratios. The outcome was a complex mathematical model that allowed me to predict the amount of fish feed required to be fed to the fish species I used. Murray cod and Australian native commercial fish to grow a known number of lettuce plants, green oak variety. This mathematical model was based on replicated experiments that were statistically analyzed and so a good amount of predictability was assured via the statistics. The predictability of the feeding rate ratio is probably the most important part important important aspect of the entire thing you have to have something that's predictable if i put x amount in i should get x amount out or x amount of feed will grow x amount of vegetables you need some type of predictability um for it to be viable especially in a commercial setting you don't want to be winging it you can wing it you can wing it of course but there's a reason why um 90 what five or something like that percent of businesses uh, go out of business within the first five years and uh, winging it not sticking to a blueprint not being um, organized is one of the main reasons. So if someone's showing you an aquaponic system, you have to, you should be asking, or if they're trying to uh, uh, um, uh, introduce you to a, uh, some type of formula or some type of ratio, you need to be asking what type of um, predictability does it have? It needs to have some type of schedule, something to determine, um, you know, how much feed uh, in, uh, can produce how much plants, something along those lines to the 95% certainty level. The predictive model was then used to set the fish feeding rate based on the plant number required to be grown in a rotational lettuce production experiment 
over many weeks. So this formula requires that the plants are in a rotational. This is a staggered production, meaning you don't plant all the your plants all at one time. Because if you do them all at one time, then this formula wouldn't work. It's going to be something different because there's the plants are taking up more nutrients if you have more plants versus if you have them staggered at different stages. So that's what this is talking about here. The outcome was that my model predicted the nitrogen removal rate to a very high level of accuracy. 97% of the nitrogen produced by the fish was removed by the plants. And this is extremely good right here. 97% accuracy, that's very, very good. So his, his, his calculations told him to put this much feed in uh, for this specific uh, uh, um, a fish, and it's going to grow this much amount of plants, and this much nitrogen is going to be left, pro almost, nearly zero. N not, not a lot of nitrogen was left. So that's pretty impressive right there, that, that predictable model that he had, that he came up with, that formula. However, the experimentation also showed that several other key nutrients were limited when nitrogen is balanced. These include phosphorus, potassium, and calcium, and several other nutrients. So there's always a con to everything. There's pros and cons. So the con is with this type of method, what happens is you have a, 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 um, a balanced nitrogen, but now you have nutrient deficiency. This is something I talked about in earlier videos about when you, if you don't have the correct stocking density and feeding rate ratios to the plant production. What happens is you'll start having... Um, um, deficiencies of other nutrients. So that's what he's experiencing right now in his um, in his trial. He's saying that there's other nutrients that are deficient as I balance the nitrogen. The chapter in my thesis that discuss this actually argues that at least phosphorus supplementation is required and supplementation of other nutrients would also be required. What this work demonstrated was that Rakasi was spot on. If you want to make sure that all nutrients are available to the plant, then you need to accept that nitrogen will be in excess. And if you balance nitrogen, then all other nutrients will be limited. So I've talked about this before in previous videos that the UVI has ran various trials on the feeding rate ratios. They didn't start out with 60 to 100 grams per square meter per day. They started out with uh, trials with um, excessive amounts and trials with lower amounts, 49 grams per square meter per day. But when you put that much, even though it's not that much from 49 to 60, it still causes significant impact on, um, on the, the, the nutrient availability, nutrient concentration in the water. So at 49 grams per square meter in a deep water culture system, you're going to have deficiencies like the doctor, like Dr. Wilson is explaining. When you start feeding at the lower rates, you're going to have nutrient deficiencies and you have to accept that. You have to accept that. That's what he's saying. You must accept that. If you want to balance the nitrogen, that's what he's talking about. You will have um, uh, nutrient deficiencies of different source. If you feed at the UVI ratios, you're going to have an excessive amount of nitrogen. You must accept these. Um, there's no way around it. This is what the science shows. So you can read the rest of this article, um, but basically I'll give you the, just the, the, the rest of the overview. So basically the solution um, to this problem, to having these um, deficiencies, is that he used an off-line mineralization tank, meaning you're extracting the nutrients from the um, the, the solids um, uh, filtration unit. You're putting it in a solids mineraliz mineralization tank. You're mineralizing the solids with air. You're aerating these solids. They're breaking down. They're dissolving into the um, in, into the, um, the the solution or the water, and then those nutrients are being reintroduced back into the system. Reintroduced back into the system. This is what you have to do if you wanna have a low stocking density and you wanna still maintain a uh, optimal plant production area. You have to reintroduce those, most people aren't doing this because most people are doing low stocking densities, but they're not reintroducing minerals back into the um, the system, if unless you're using like a, um, a flood and drain system, which the mineralization process is already built into it. So that's why some people are able to get away with these lower stocking densities in a flood and drain system. It's already built in there. Those solids are being mineralized and they're being reintroduced back into the system. But if you're using a deep water culture system, an NFT vertical, if you want to have low stocking densities, you have to reintroduce those solids back into the system or else you're going to be doing hydroponics with the fish cover up. So another thing that I want to uh, point out with this type of method is that when you keep reading this literature, he starts talking about how this is a crop specific and a fish specific type of approach. 
So that that means that this is designed for monocropping one type of crop in the system. Either you're going to put like a romaine lettuce or a bib lettuce in the system, and then you're growing one type of fish. So he discusses that if you change any of that, you try to mix the species, or not the species, you try to mix the crops together, put a variety of crops, he's saying it's not going to work when you read um, the literature. So that's one thing that you have to uh, uh, be mindful of with this type of solution. Now, there's not much literature on the exacts of this type of uh, method. That's why I don't teach it. See, I don't care what type of method it is. As long as it's predictable, scientifically proven, and it's not too labor intensive, then I have no problem at all teaching it. I actually welcome these type of um, uh, different type of formulas and stuff like that. But it has to be it has to meet certain guidelines or I'm not dealing with it at all. It's not worth my time teaching it to other people because it's going to make it's just going to be a waste of time. So there's not too many ways that you can actually size the hydroponic and aquaculture um, components. It's just not possible. It's limited. So it's really these two are pretty much pretty much it. You either feed up front with the UVI ratio, have all your nutrients available in the system because the UVI ratio, it doesn't require mineralization being introduced, mineralized solids being introduced back into the system. It doesn't require that. All That's why it's a high feeding amount up front. But this one, if you want a low amount and you still want to have a large plant production area, you're going to have to reintroduce them back into the system. And that's pretty much it. Most systems, formulas are going to fall into one of those categories either you're going to do it the uvi way or you're going to do it the um the dr um uh, wilson way um and there's going to be variations of these people have different ways like i see decoupled systems um they're pretty much doing the same thing introducing solids uh, mineralized solids from one tank and putting it back into another system it's all the same thing but i'm worried about if it's predictable then i'll start teaching it so he doesn't have much information out on this um at all he has a book coming out and i'm going to purchase the book whenever it does come out and then i if he has the formulas in there then i'm going to definitely teach it to you guys i'm definitely going to teach it build a few systems on my own test it out and then go ahead and teach it uh teach it to the people <laughs>